You are now listening to Sorel Gore MD. Sorel Gore MD. You thought I was done with stents? Nah, man, we're just getting started. I'm moving through the stent cascade. Here I have a covered stent. All right, this is the Fluency Stent by Bard. I want to thank Parks Batten for providing me with this stent. This is a nitinol skeleton stent that is covered or encapsulated by EPTFE. Okay. So there's EPTFE on the inside and there's EPTFE on the outside. Ice cream paint job is optional. What's the deal with this stent? Okay. It's got a decent radial force. Right, there's a radial force. Uh, in my opinion, it's kind of got poor flexibility. So if you try to flex this stent, you notice it tends to kind of kink. Um, you can sort of see what the lumen looks like there. Um, so obviously uh, not going to be very patent when it's being flexed. So in my opinion, I want to use this stent personally for tips because a tips tract is often tortuous and I don't think this stent would be ideal. Uh, the ideal stent would of course be the viator. So what is this stent really used for? This stent has a primary indication for treating instant restenosis and dialysis access grafts or fistulas. So in case you don't know what I'm talking about, hemodialysis can be performed in any of three ways. There is basically the catheter form, which is the perm cath, which I love placing and place those all the time. And then there are arteriovenous anastomoses, basically an AV fistula, which is a direct connection from an artery into a vein. And then there's an AV graft, which goes from the artery to the graft and then the graft to the vein. So the AV access is what allows a patient to physically hook up from their body to the dialysis machine and it allows for a very fast flow of blood out of the patient into the machine to get treated and then back into the patient's vein uh, to basically be used by the body. So the problem with all AV accesses, grafts or fistula, whatever it is, is that they fail. And what does that mean? Basically, the fistula or graft will not be able to be used reliably for dialysis. The way that fistulas fail is by the development of venous stenosis. Now let's face it, veins were never meant to see arterialized blood. Veins are low flow systems, they're low pressure, right? they're used to a nice smooth low pressure flow of blood. When you hook them up to a pumping artery, they're going to react. Right? How do they react? They react by developing hyperplasia of the intima. Okay? The intima is that innermost lining of cells, it develops hyperplasia, it develops basically a small narrowing or stenosis, and if that stenosis is hemodynamically significant, that fistula or graft cannot be used for dialysis. One way to deal with the problem of venous hyperplasia leading to narrowing is to do angioplasty. Take a balloon, blow it up, pop that area of hyperplasia, flatten it out, and then restore flow. This works a majority of the time. Now when that fails, the next option is to place a stent. Okay? Now if you place a bare metal stent, it can fail in the same way. Tissue can grow through the interstices of the stent and again cause hyperplasia, narrowing, and then thrombosis. So what do you do then? If you place a stent and the stent fails, what now? Well, what now is this stent, okay? Uh, this stent can be placed inside the existing stent and can improve patency, and there's a really nice study that demonstrated this, and I'll talk about it a little bit. A uh, really nice study called the Rescue Study, all right, received an award in 2016 for an excellent paper. Um, it studied this stent in the use of in-stent restenosis of AV grafts and fistulas. The main endpoint was something that was called access site primary patency at six months. They took patients and they randomized them to either getting angioplasty or this stent for treatment of in-stent restenosis. And then at six months out, they looked at what is that patient's freedom from another intervention or another thrombotic event of that access. Now the main result was that the access site primary patency in the patients that got this stent was that 18.6% of those patients had freedom from another intervention at six months versus 4.5% of the patients that got angioplasty. So another way to put that is that patients that got this stent, 80% of them needed a procedure within the next six months versus the people that only got angioplasty, 95% of them needed a procedure. So that difference of about 15% landed this stent an in indication for treatment of instant restenosis. Now, if those percentages seem abysmal to you, um, they are. And what it takes is you have to reset your thermostat 
um, what you think is an acceptable percentage when you're dealing with end-stage renal disease and hemodialysis access. All right? I'm, I've always been a good student. I'm used to numbers like 95%, but you're never going to get those kind of numbers when you're dealing with hemodialysis access. Um, how do I go forward with this information? Well, if I'm dealing with this problem, if I see a stent in a patient, a bare metal stent, in a patient that has ESRD, and that stent has started to thrombose based on an ultrasound or based on a venogram, I'm going to consider use of this stent because per the data, this would provide improved patency at six months. All right, so that's what I want to say today. Uh, that's it for this video. Sorel RMD, thank you for watching.